Author John Kuiper Liberty presents Gospel Theology, God's Good News for Everything, published by Westbow Press, Bloomington, Indiana, 2021, used with permission. Appendix G, Your Righteous Rules Endure Forever, God's Abiding Moral Standard. Is there one standard of right and wrong that is equally valid and applicable to all people for all time? Or are right and wrong unique for each person and free to change across societies or as time passes? Thankfully, the Bible provides answers to these essential questions. Psalm 119, 160 says, The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. God's moral law has always been in effect and will never change, since it is the eternal expression of his character. Although other summaries of this law are found in Scripture, it is most clearly summarized in the Ten Commandments. This essay will define God's moral law and discuss its expression before the fall and during the administrations of the Old and New Covenants. Defining Moral Law It is important to begin by defining the distinct types of law in the Bible. The 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith describes the three types of biblical law, moral, 19.2, ceremonial, 19.3, and judicial, 19.4. According to this Confession of Faith, the ceremonial laws contain several typical ordinances, partly of worship, prefiguring Christ, His graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits, and partly holding forth diverse instructions of moral duties, all which ceremonial laws being appointed only to the time of Reformation are, by Jesus Christ the true Messiah and only lawgiver, who was furnished with power from the Father for that end abrogated and taken away. John Frame describes the judicial law as that which includes crimes punishable by the state and the penalties required for them. The 1689 Confession says these laws expired with the state of Israel. However, the judicial law contained moral elements, the general equity, which is still of moral use for societies today. The moral law, the Confession says, is that law which doth forever bind all. God's moral law defines right and wrong for all people in all cultures at all times. But where does this moral law come from? The law of God is good, Romans 7, 12, and 16. But the law of God is not good as a standard distinct from God himself. God alone defines goodness because he himself is goodness. John Frame explains that God does not create goodness as he creates the world so that he could change it tomorrow. Goodness is neither above God nor below God. Rather, goodness is God. God is his own goodness. Goodness is God's eternal attribute. Without his goodness, he would not be God. So he will never be other than good. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all, 1 John 1, 5. And anyone who does not love God does not know God, because God is love, 1 John 4, 8. The highest goodness is a person. So our supreme standard of goodness, holiness, righteousness, and love is an absolute person. So the law of God is an extension of his character. As John Calvin states, For our Lord has so portrayed his nature in the law that if anyone were to fulfill its commands, he would embody God's very image in his own life. God did not create his moral law, making decisions as to what he would see as good and what he would see as evil. In one sense, Even the civil, judicial, and ceremonial aspects of God's law are an eternal expression of his character and are not abolished in the new covenant. Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, 17-19, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was clear that he did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. Greg Bonson explains, Moses wrote that forever it would go well with God's people to observe the commandments which he revealed, Deuteronomy 12, 28. 
David exclaimed that all his precepts are sure. They are established forever and ever. Psalm 111, 7 through 8. Indeed, the eternal authority of God's commands characterizes each and every one of them. Psalm 119, 160. The ceremonial aspects of the law typified God's character as Savior and foreshadowed redemption in Jesus Christ. Christians do keep these laws in a certain way, although the form of how they are kept looks different compared to the Old Testament in light of their fulfillment in Christ. Hebrews 8.13 Commenting on ceremonial law, Bonson is again helpful. None of these laws is observed today in the manner of the Old Testament shadows, and yet they are confirmed for us. The principle they taught is still valid. For instance, the ceremonial law prescribed the necessity of shed blood for atonement, Leviticus 17.11. And accordingly, when Christ made atonement for our sins once for all, it was therefore necessary that he shed his blood for us, Hebrews 9.22-24. The Old Testament redemptive system called for a Passover lamb to be sacrificed, and Christ is that lamb for us. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. The ceremonial laws separated Israel from the nations by requiring a separation to be drawn between clean and unclean meats and by prohibiting the unequal yoking of animals. In the New Testament, the outward form of such laws has been surpassed. The spreading of the redeemed community to the Gentiles renders all meats clean, Acts 10, and the sacrifice of Christ has put the system of ordinances, which separated the Jews and Gentiles, out of gear, Ephesians 2, 11-20. But their basic requirement of holy separation from the unclean world of unbelief is still confirmed and in force, 2 Corinthians 6.14. The ceremonial law is therefore confirmed by Christ, even though not kept in its shadow form by New Testament believers. So in one sense, all laws are moral in that they define right and wrong and still have application today. But this essay is defining moral law as laws that are based on our nature as creatures in the image of God and are therefore literally normative for all history. Where is this moral law most adequately summarized? The historic confessional position has answered that question by pointing to the Ten Commandments, otherwise known as the Decalogue, Ten Words. But is the concept of the Ten Commandments as the summary of God's unchanging moral law found in the ultimate authority, the Bible? The Ten Commandments pre-Sinai The moral law of God did not come into existence through Moses' interaction with God on Mount Sinai. This law was deposited into the consciences of human beings from the very beginning. Romans 1, 18-32 discusses man's relationship to God in his natural state. Paul says that all men are accountable to God because they know him. Although they know him, they suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. Romans 1, 18-23 They do not only know God, but they know God's righteous decree. Romans 1, 32 What are these righteous decrees of God that both Jews and Gentiles know? Paul lists some of them. Covetousness, malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossip, slander, hating God, boastfulness, disobedience to parents, and more, Romans 1, 29-32. Richard Barcelos notes, Many of the sins mentioned in this section of Romans 1 are direct violations of aspects of the Decalogue. This at least suggests that the Ten Commandments can easily be consulted when pointing out the sins of men without special revelation. This means that the essence of the commandments contained in the Decalogue predate their special promulgation on Mount Sinai. Furthermore, Romans 2, 14-15 says, For when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. The Gentiles do not have the law, the special revelation of Scripture, but when they, by nature, do what the law requires, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, Romans 2.15. This does not mean that all people will always agree on what God's moral law is apart from special revelation, because sin can defile consciences. Titus 1.15, and it has corrupted the mind and heart, Romans 8.7. Totally depraved man may have the work of the law written on his heart, 
but to one degree or another he suppresses the truth in his unrighteousness. Romans 1.18 Nevertheless, this moral law of God is common to all people in the sense that all people are required to obey God's moral standard and will be judged by that one standard. Romans 3.19 says that the law gives commands in order to stop every mouth and show that the whole world is accountable to God, not only Jews. Romans 3.9 If this law is summarized in the Ten Commandments, one would expect to see examples of men breaking these laws prior to their official publication in Exodus 20. Is this the case? The first commandment says, You shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 23. Were people aware of this commandment before Mount Sinai? Certainly. Philip Ross explains the pre-Sinai evidence for this commandment, beginning with Adam and Eve in the garden. The heart of the serpent's enticement is the temptation to set up other gods before the Lord, namely themselves. As Adam and Eve surrender to temptation, they grasp after equality with God, snatching at deity and godlike capacity. Further on, it is unimaginable that Noah, who walked with God, Genesis 6-9, having had such direct experience of the Lord's preservation, could sacrifice to or worship another god before the Lord, Genesis 8, 20-21. Similarly, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have no other gods before the Lord before he has even declared it should be so. The folly of idolatry, the second commandment, is dealt with in Genesis 31-35 as Jacob tells his household to put away their foreign gods, Genesis 35, 2. The third commandment, ensuring the honor of the Lord's name, is seen in the awe that comes from the name of God, Genesis 18, 27. The regularity of Noah and the patriarchs having his name on their lips, Genesis 9, 26. And the utilization of his name in oaths, Genesis 24, 3. The fourth commandment, keeping the Sabbath holy, is seen in Exodus 16, four chapters before Sinai, Israel was commanded to not gather, since the day was a solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord, Exodus 16, 23. The fifth commandment, honoring parents, is impossible to miss in the patriarchal era. Children recognize the authority of their parents, Genesis 42, 29 through 43, 13, and fathers are entrusted with blessing children, Genesis 27, 30 through 38. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior, Hebrews 7.7 7. The Lord's displeasure at the breaking of the sixth commandment, forbidding murder, is seen when Cain murders his brother Abel, Genesis 4.9-14, in Simeon and Levi's assassinations, Genesis 34.26, and Moses hiding after he committed murder, Exodus 2.11-14. The seventh commandment, forbidding adultery, is assumed in the one flesh union of Adam and Eve in the garden, Genesis 2.23-25, and is discussed twice in Abraham's sinful willingness to give up Sarah to other men in order to preserve his life, Genesis 12, 10 through 12, and 20, 3 through 7. The eighth commandment, forbidding theft, is broken in the garden when Adam and Eve steal the fruit, and is also seen in Jacob and Laban defrauding one another in Genesis 30 through 31. It is also on display in Rachel stealing from her father, Genesis 31:19. The ninth commandment, forbidding bearing false witness and lying, is recognized in deceitfulness bringing cursing rather than blessing, Genesis 27, 12. Commenting on the pervasive deceitfulness in Genesis, Ross says, All this deceitfulness frequently accompanies other wrongdoing, which leads to judgment. It is a known and intentional sin. The tenth commandment, forbidding coveting, is found in the envy of Cain leading him to murder his brother, Genesis 4, 3-9, the jealousy of Joseph's brothers, Genesis 37, 11, and in the various stories detailing the schisms that destroyed the unity of Abraham's family, Genesis 13. It is clear that the Ten Commandments were functioning as God's moral standard even before Sinai. The Ten Commandments Between Sinai and the New Covenant it is not debated that the Ten Commandments played a key role in the Mosaic Law in the Old Testament nation of Israel, but is there anything in the Mosaic Covenant suggesting that the Ten Commandments summarized God's permanent moral standard? The Ten Commandments were unique among the rest of the Mosaic Law in several ways. First, the Ten Commandments were written with the finger of God on tablets of stone, Exodus 20, 1-7, Deuteronomy 9:10. Exodus 31, 18 says, and God gave to Moses, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, 
the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. The other commandments were written by Moses in a book referred to as the Book of the Law, Deuteronomy 31.26. Second, these two stone tablets were placed inside of the Ark of the Covenant, Deuteronomy 10, 1 through 5, while the book of the law was placed next to the Ark of the Covenant, Deuteronomy 31, 26. Second Chronicles 5, 10 says, There was nothing in the Ark except the two tablets that Moses put there at Horeb. Third, the Ten Commandments are explicitly pointed out as having a central place in the Mosaic Covenant. Ross comments, The Pentateuch marks out the Decalogue from general legislation as the Ten Words, Exodus 34, 28. At a deeper level, those Ten Words were the covenant or testimony itself, Exodus 25, 16, and 21. This is further proved by the clear statements in the rest of the Old Testament that distinguish between the moral and ceremonial law, 1 Samuel 15, 22, Psalm 40, 6 through 8, Psalm 51, 16 through 17, Jeremiah 7, 22 through 23. And the Decalogue was not only prominent in the Pentateuch, it also holds a central place in the writings of the prophets later on in the Old Testament. Ross says, Throughout the prophets, the sins condemned are the transgression of law that can be traced back to the Decalogue. This framework is displayed in the myriad of examples the prophets give of people breaking the Ten Commandments. For example, the first commandment is clearly referenced when Jeremiah writes, Has a nation changed its gods even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jeremiah 2, 11-13 The second commandment, forbidding idolatry, is all over the writings of the prophets. Hosea 8, 4 through 6. Examples of the other eight commandments abound. The importance of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament is clear. This does not mean, however, that the judicial or civil law of the Old Testament is not moral and relevant for modern society. There were ceremonial elements of the judicial law that were particular to the special nation of Old Testament Israel, certainly, but there were other elements of the judicial law that are more detailed expressions of what was written in summary form in the Ten Commandments and are therefore moral and eternally binding on civil governments today. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. The Puritan and Congregationalist John Owen rightly said, Doubtless there is something moral in those institutions of the Israelite civil law, which, being unclothed of their judicial form, is still binding to all and in the like kind as to some analogy and proportion. Subduct from those administrations what was proper to and lies upon the account of the church and nation of the Jews, and what remains upon the general notion of a church and nation must be everlastingly binding. The well-known 18th century Reformed Baptist pastor John Gill agreed, It may be inquired whether the judicial laws or the laws respecting the Jewish polity are now in force or not, and to be observed or not, which may be resolved by distinguishing between them, there were some that were peculiar to the state of the Jews, their continuance in the land of Canaan, and while their polity lasted and until the coming of the Messiah, when they were to cease, as is clear from Genesis 49.10, such as related to inheritances and the alienation of them by marriage or otherwise, the restoration of them when sold at the year of Jubilee, the marrying of a brother's wife when he died without issue, etc., the design of which was to keep the tribes distinct until the Messiah came, that it might be clearly known from what tribe he sprung. But then there were other judicial laws, which were founded on the light of nature, on reason, and on justice and equity, and these remain in full force, and they must be wise as well as righteous laws, which were made by God himself, their king and legislator, as they are said to be, Deuteronomy 4, 6, and 8. And they are, certainly, the best constituted and regulated governments that come nearest to the commonwealth of Israel and the civil laws of it, which are of the kind last described, and where they are acted up unto, there what is said by wisdom is most truly verified. By me kings reign, and princes decree judgment. And if these laws were more strictly attended to, 
which respect the punishment of offenses, especially capital ones, things would be put upon a better footing than they are in some governments, and judges, in passing sentences, would be able to do that part of their office with more certainty and safety and with a better conscience. And whereas the commonwealth of Israel was governed by these laws for many hundreds of years and needed no other in their civil polity, when in such a course of time every case that ordinarily happens must arise and be brought into a court of judicature, I cannot but be of opinion that a digest of civil laws might be made out of the Bible, the law of the Lord that is perfect, either as lying in express words in it, or to be deduced by the analogy of things and cases, and by just consequence, as would be sufficient for the government of any nation, and then there would be no need of so many law books, nor of so many lawyers, and perhaps there would be fewer lawsuits. Furthermore, many of the civil punishments of the Israelite judicial system were based on God's eternally moral and just principle of similar measure and restoration. The punishment must fit the crime and seek to make the offended party whole as much as possible, for example, Exodus 21, 18-20. This principle was in effect before Sinai, Genesis 9-6, after Sinai before Christ, Exodus 21-24, during Christ's life, Luke 19-8, and after Christ's resurrection and ascension, Acts 25-11. Modern society should look to the general equity of the Bible's civil-slash-judicial law to understand both the role of civil government and just penalties for crimes. The Ten Commandments in the New Covenant does the New Testament also teach that the Ten Commandments summarize the eternal moral law of God? One of the most well-known passages promising the New Covenant in the Old Testament is Jeremiah 31, 31-34. God says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Jeremiah 31, 33. God refers to the law he will write in the hearts of New Covenant Christians as my law. Barcelos comments, It is very clear that Jeremiah is referring to an objective standard of known and expected conduct when he uses the phrase my law. Whatever this law is, we know that it is God's and that it had already been revealed to God's Old Covenant people at that time of the writing of Jeremiah. So this law that God would write would not be a new law. Furthermore, the text says this law is written by God. Exodus 31.18 says that the Ten Commandments were written on tablets of stone with the finger of God. When these verses are considered with 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, it is clear that what will be written on the heart of Christians are the Ten Commandments. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3. Paul links the writing of the law and tablets of stone with human hearts, clearly referencing Jeremiah 31.33. Commenting on Jeremiah 31.33, Barcelos says, Both antecedent, Exodus 31.18, and subsequent revelation, 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, force us to reckon with the fact that the law of God written by God himself was what he wrote on stone. In a very unique way, the Ten Commandments comprise the law of God. We conclude, the blessings of the New Covenant include the writing of the Ten Commandments on the hearts of all God's people under it. The work of the law, in Romans 2, 14-15, written on the hearts of all people, has been commented on above. This law is most likely the Ten Commandments, since later in the same chapter, Romans 2, 21-22, Paul explicitly mentions the second 7th, and 8th commandments. In Romans 7, 7-13, Paul discusses the nature of the law and quotes the 10th commandment when he says, For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. Romans 7, 7. In Romans 13, 8-10, Paul quotes three of the commandments in proving that love is the fulfilling of the law. The rest of the New Testament is also clear that the Ten Commandments are the moral law of God. No one is justified by this law, Romans 3, 20-28, but it is still the standard of righteousness and is to be obeyed, Romans 3, 31, Romans 8, 3-4, 1 Corinthians 7, 19, John 14, 15. By quoting the fifth commandment in Ephesians 6, 2, 
Paul assumed that his readers knew it was obvious that the Ten Commandments remain God's moral law in the New Covenant. James also mentions several of the Ten Commandments, assuming that keeping them is a part of fulfilling the whole law, James 2, 8-12. Jesus presented commandments in the Decalogue to the rich young man who asked what he must do to inherit eternal life, Matthew 19, 16-19. But did Jesus change the Ten Commandments in the Sermon on the Mount? Not at all. John Frame comments, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount contains extended exposition of some of the commands in the Decalogue. He condemns the oversimplifications and distortions of the scribes and Pharisees, but he affirms the commandments in their deepest significance. For example, the Old Testament was clear that hatred and lust arise from the heart, Leviticus 19.17. The Tenth Commandment, forbidding coveting a neighbor's wife, is undoubtedly a prohibition against sexual desire. The saying to hate your enemy, Matthew 5.43, was not from the law of God, but from scribal tradition. Jesus pointed his hearers back to the true meaning of law, since Leviticus 19.17-18 had already explained God's law to teach, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus does give his disciples a new commandment in John 13, 34, to love one another, but this commandment is both old and new, as John clarifies in 1 John 2, 7 through 8. It is old because it has been from the beginning, 1 John 2, 7, but it is new in the sense that they now have a clear example of what it means since they saw Christ's example. God's law becomes a delight to those who have been united to Christ. Psalm 1, 2, Psalm 119, 18. Conclusion God's moral law never changes because it is an expression of his unchanging character. Moral and binding elements are contained in the entirety of God's law, but the moral law is most clearly summarized in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are deposited into the consciences of all men, but sinful men with seared consciences who suppress the truth and unrighteousness are not ultimately able to discern right and wrong without God's word and spirit. Each of the Ten Commandments were in effect prior to the giving of the tablets on Mount Sinai. At Sinai, the commandments were written with the finger of God on stone tablets and placed inside of the Ark of the Covenant. God promised to write these same commandments in the hearts of Christians, enabling us to begin to obey his law by the power of the Spirit. Jesus affirmed and exposited the true meaning of the Ten Commandments, and the apostles upheld them as the standard of righteousness for Christians who have been justified by faith alone. The Christian, in union with Jesus Christ, can cry out with the psalmist, Oh, how I love your law! Psalm 119, 97.